All right. Well, good morning, everybody. We're just um, waiting a few mi more minutes. We we definitely had quite a few people registered today, and um, I know it's a beautiful day out. And <clears throat> for people that are sugars, they're probably busy in the sugar woods um, today as well. So you just never know <laughs> what kind of wet weather you're going to have this time of the year. And it just happened today was beautiful. So thanks for not playing hooky because we didn't, <laughs> right? Um, because we have really uh, an exciting program today and uh, really excited to be able to um, start working on sensory of a variety of products, but most of our work um, so far at UVM has been focused on dairy. And we're also kind of diving into to other um, agricultural and food products as well. And today our sensory seminar is again, gonna be focused on dairy products. Our webinar today is brought to you um, by the funding from the USDA NIFA program. Um, our, our project here, our program at UVM has been working on dairy sensory um, mostly focused on grass-fed products, but now with funding from the Dairy Innovation Center that is hosted and run through the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, we'll also be doing um, sensory work on artisan cheese, which will be kicking off on Friday, actually. So we're excited about that. And, and like I said, we're working on many other agricultural products as well from... Um, tortillas and corn to distilled spirits, which has been fun too. <laughs> All right. So um, just, we had a, our first uh, dairy webinar in our dairy production series yesterday. And that webinar was focused on um, alternative milking frequencies. We had some speakers from both Vermont and New Zealand, <laughs> like it's our neighbor. Um, and we were talking about alternative milking frequencies and we do have a new project through Northeast Sare. Um, I'm hearing myself echo and Susan, I'm assuming it's because you have your mic. There we go. Um, so our project through Northeast Sare is focused on alternative milking strategies or frequencies. And we're trying to gather more information on farms that actually um, employ some of these systems. So we're talking about milking once a day, milking seasonally, milking three times in two days, and really trying to understand um, the characteristics of those farms, the um, cost of producing milk in those types of systems, the uh, quality of milk that those farms are able to produce and lots of other metrics. So the first step in that project is um, conducting a, a survey. And so if you're on this call and you weren't on the call yesterday, if you are a farm that is producing milk, we wanna hear from you. And Sarah, I'm sure will put the survey link in the chat box. It's a really short survey. And again, even if you are not implementing an alternative milking frequency, we would like to hear from you um, because we're also trying to understand, you know, how, um, if you if you are interested, if you've tried it, what are some of the barriers um, to adoption of these types of practices? All right, so thanks Sarah for putting that in the chat box. If you are using an alternative frequency and you wanna get further involved in your project, please also reach out. We have lots of opportunities to engage with our group and some real benefits, um, like we are offering monthly DHI testing to um, farmers that are working with us for free. So that's a great benefit right there. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn the show over to Roy and for, those of you who have not met Roy, Roy uh, DeRochers is a sensory expert at UVM Extension. He's been with us now over a year and he's supporting the food and beverage industry all over the world for the last 35 years. 
Um, his experience includes numerous global initiatives, including milk, cheese, and yogurt. And as you might have heard, he also helped develop milk duds, one of my favorite snack foods, as well as a few other <laughs> as well as a few other snack foods too, um, and important beverages like Jack Daniels. Uh, his focus is on the link between product sensory attributes, consumer acceptance, and sustained success in the market. Um, and everybody was instructed to get some materials today to be involved um, or to really be interactive with the session. So hopefully you were able to do that. And Roy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> fantastic. Can, every, can you hear me, Heather? Sarah, yep. just make sure you can hear me. Okay, well, welcome everyone. And uh, I wish we could be here in person, but obviously with, with things the way they are, we're gonna do this virtually and do the best we can to communicate some of these sensory things. Now, for those of you that got the list of things that we're gonna use, great. As we go through, I'll prompt you which things to have ready and, and then when we taste them, how to taste them and what we're looking for. Um, if for some chance you didn't get some of the supplies or didn't get any of the supplies, that's no problem either because I would encourage you to listen in, ask questions, and then do some of the tasting after the fact because I think it's pretty straightforward. Roy, um, can I ask you a quick question? I'm sorry. Do you want folks to um, put their videos on? Wait, we have a smaller group and I know part of sensory is interacting. Um, so that's up to you, but I just, you know, if you want people yeah, unmuting I, I, themselves during the program and asking questions, please, please let them know. I'm yes. just putting the, it out the, there. The, the answer is yes to all of the above. If, if you feel comfortable and want to turn your camera on, that's great. I'm a people person. I'd love to see people as we're, as we're interacting and tasting together, um, it, it would be helpful, but if you would rather not, that's fine as well. And definitely, since we have a small number of people, if as I'm going through this, there's a question or you want clarification, I have no problem with you unmuting and just jumping in and saying, excuse me for a minute and asking a question. I think uh, um, we can deal with it with a small group of people. It's just if we have 40, 50 people, sometimes it gets a little bit crazy. So yep, feel free to turn your cameras on. I'd love to see people's faces. Um, as Heather said, one of the things that we wanted to do was build on what we did la at last year's dairy conference. And so part of today's workshop will be a little bit of review of things we did for that uh, presentation. Now that presentation wasn't focused necessarily on sensory. We really wanted to get to talking about the sensory work we were doing on grass fed milk. Today's session is a little bit different. So you're going to notice from the very beginning, we're, we're going to dive in a little deeper. We're going to get a little bit more detailed about some logistical things with sensory. We're going to review some of the basics like taste buds and the nose and mouth feels um, with some of the products that I asked you to pick up. But then we're going to transition at the end of this into some dairy products. And we're going to look at milk and talk about milk. And we're going to look at cheese, talk about cheese. And we're going to look at some yogurt and talk about yogurt. And then we'll wrap up the whole session. And we certainly will keep it within the time. I know it's a beautiful day out there. And I'm hoping to finish through all the slides and the tasting with enough time that we can have some questions and answers, but that's gonna depend on you. If you end up asking a lot of questions during a presentation, which is okay, then maybe we have a little less time at the end um, or save them to the end. It's whatever you feel comfortable with. One of the first things that I wanna show, and I, Susan, do I have control because I'm hitting page on, okay. This is the list I just wanted to share um, for a few minutes that we had sent out of things that you could have on hand to taste and smell while we're going through the program. The first section that we're gonna talk about will be on with the tongue and taste buds, and that will be the solution. So if you were able to make up any of these three sets of solutions, the ones using sugar and table salt and vinegar, um, you go ahead and put those somewhere close by because that's, if I go through a few introductory slides, that'll be one of the first things we're gonna do. And then we're gonna get into some aromatics, so we'll need the candies, and then we'll get into some mouthfeels, we'll need the juices, and we'll get into some concepts like order of appearance, which we didn't spend much time on last time. And then we'll end up with the milk, the cheese, and the yogurt. But again, I'll give you a heads up each time uh, we get to one of those pieces that's gonna be interactive. Now, as Heather said, I am super excited to be part of her group and be at UVM. I've been here a little over a year, but as many of you heard last year, most of my experience has been with those very large international companies. And it's, it's knowledge and information that I gained working on that level 
that I'm bringing to the table in Vermont and New England and to workshops like this. So as straightforward as some of this information is that I'm gonna present about sensory and tasting dairy products, this is well proven and it's very powerful stuff when it comes to being successful in the market. And so I encourage you to, um, to ask questions, but um, to also participate along and, and try to get, give yourself some self-experience in doing some of this. I wanted to start with this slide because we are in a unique situation. Normally when I do my safety slide, I would be telling you at a conference, look, everything I'm giving you is safe to taste. Don't worry, I'm not gonna try to kill you. Even though it may taste bad, it's safe. Well, you got your own stuff. So I'm assuming that whatever you got, you were able to buy at the store or it's something in your house that hasn't been there for five years. So you're not worried about anything being toxic at this point. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about a couple other safety points as we jump into this. The first one is that the safety of our tasters is always our highest priority. And not just for yourself, you'll, you'll hear me uh, touch on in this workshop, if you invite someone to taste with you, whether it's someone in your company, in your house, or somewhere out in the public, it's your responsibility to look out for the safety of everybody that's tasting. And so you really need to think about what are the rules, especially in this, this world we're living in with COVID and what we're gonna be living with as we move forward. Everything has to be safe to smell and taste, which means it has to be uh, uh, fresh, it can't be spoiled. Um, it has to be something that doesn't have any chemical contamination. And in today's COVID world, it has to be something that we don't think that there's any uh, risk of getting COVID from. And the perfect example of that is we can't share samples anymore. Because if we share our sniffy jars or we share a sample, say, hey, taste this, smell this, then we are, we are upping the risk dramatically that we're gonna transfer a virus to someone. So when we say everything must be safe to smell and taste, it's not just the products now, but we really have to think about the process. Um, we take it very seriously, uh, seriously in our group and at UVM and, and we encourage everybody else to do the same. We still worry about allergies. I'm assuming that since you got your own products that I don't need to worry about you having an allergic reaction today. But again, if you're tasting with someone else, you need to be aware of people's allergies and make sure you're not giving them things. Um, if they're allergic to, to dairy products, for example, that um, you're not giving them something that they could have a either an acute reaction or even something that's just gonna make them um, feel uncomfortable. I always say this, you heard this at the, those people that were there last year, smell and taste as little of the sample as you need. When you, when you start tasting a lot and get a lot of experience, you'll notice that you need very small amounts and even though everything's safe, it's just good practice to evaluate as, as little amount of sample as possible. The other reason for that is what we call sensory fatigue. If you taste too much, you might end up blanking out on that flavor in the next sample. This last one is one that we haven't talked much about, but you never taste samples that you don't know the history of. So if you work at a, at a dairy farm, if you work at a, a cheese operation, if you're working at a yoga factory, if you're making ice cream, and somebody brings a sample back to you or sends it in the mail and complains and says there's something wrong with this. The one thing that we never do as professional tasters is taste those types of samples. If, if you don't know the complete history of where that sample's been and what's happened to it, the risk is too high to taste. There's a debate about whether or not it's safe to smell. Many, many professional people will smell complaint samples because it's a lot safer than actually putting in your mouth and getting direct contact with uh, the inside of your mouth. Um, a few words about sensory habits and hygiene, because this is important as you start thinking about sensory analysis of, of dairy products. Um, we need to observe what we call good sensory hygiene. And the reason for that is that we are very sensitive, powerful instruments. And I'll talk about that in a minute, that we can smell things that instruments can't pick up. And because of that, um, anything can be a distraction. So for example, we need to make sure we're not wearing perfume or aftershave or using uh, shampoo that has fragrance, um, anything. Uh, you pull your clothes out you know, after the, the summer, your winter comes and they've been sitting in mothballs and you smell like mothballs. You have to think about all of these things because the last thing you wanna do is to bring an aroma into the panel room or into the area that you're doing sensory and cause a distraction for this very sensitive instrument and what's going on. Um, we always tell people wash your hands frequently, especially these days, but we ask for a sensory panel that right before panel, avoid using a lot of soap. Again, you can leave residual fragrance on your hands and avoid drying your hands with paper towels. 
Paper towels contain a lot of phenolic compounds. And if you ever go into a bathroom, use a paper towel, smell your hands. And what you're gonna smell is wet cardboard or wet paper towel on your hands. And that becomes an issue if you're on sensory panel. If you're a smoker, we don't see too many of them these days, but if you're a smoker, we don't allow smoking within an hour of a panel. Um, and we have special uh, rules for people that are smokers because they also can smell like smoke their clothes. So we'll have them put on a lab jacket or a coat or something so the rest of the panel doesn't smell the smoke. And then we also ask people not to eat or drink within 30 minutes of a panel because that can interfere with the sensory analysis. Um, we all know about brushing our teeth, avoid breath mints, all of that. There's a long list of this. If you're interested, we can give you more um, ideas about how to have good sensory habits. Or the other way to think about that is how to keep the sensory panel room as odor free as possible, including whatever odor you're bringing into the room. Now, today we're gonna to talk about sensory analysis of dairy products, but I wanna take a step back again and, and talk about why this is important. Because there are actually people in the world that think, hey, I can produce a good tasting milk or a good tasting cheese or a good tasting yogurt. And as long as I got good marketing, I have money to market and sell, I can be successful, I can sell anything. And we do need good marketing and I'll talk about that in a minute, but flavor, the sensory properties, the aroma, the flavor, the texture, are what, what drives sustained success to the market. So if you want to be successful and stay successful, you really do have to worry about what your product tastes like, smells like, and feels like. This is a graph that I show all the time. It's, a, it's actually a beer graph where each color point on this graph is a brand of beer. And so that if you see four, like these four green dots are four different brands of beer from one brewer. Well, the point I want to make without going into too, too much detail, because this is a very powerful map. It has over 100,000 tastings in it, represents the U.S. market. I want you to notice these four gold dots. Those are four different brands from the number one brewer in the United States, which happens to be Anheuser-Busch. Now, we can debate whether it's good tasting beer or not, because I happen to love craft beer and microbrew. I love Vermont beer. But the fact of the matter is that a, a bunch of people drink products that are Pilsners like Anheuser-Busch's, Budweiser, Bud Light. And if you look in this flavor map, this is just data generated by trained people who are being objective. You can see that their brands clearly differentiate from all the other beer in the market on this dimension, which is what we call cleanness. Consumers like things on the left that are more clean. And then they get product uh, segmentation or SKUs by having different flavor identity. Some of these are very light flavored, some are heavy flavored, some are in the middle. And, and I could show you maps like this for cheese and milk and yogurt, where we see that the market leading products differentiate themselves in blind tasting by professional panelists on these flavor maps. And it tells us that flavor is important if you wanna be successful in the market. So we need, we need to really pay attention to flavor and be able to measure it. And that's why this kind of workshop is so important. Now we have these four pillars of success. Again, talking about why doing sensory and why flavor is important. And these four pillars are the things that, that you or any company that produces a, a dairy product, let's say, whether, whether you're selling it as an ingredient in another product or selling it as a final product, you need to do these four things. You need to have a good marketing campaign. You need to communicate the image and the sales. And the most powerful marketing campaigns we know of contain sensory information. You then need to deliver the sensory quality that the customer wants. You need to do it that way all the time. You can't just do it once and then have it changed the next week. You need to be consistent. And then on this bottom one, you need to do it at the right price. So you have to figure out how to market, how to produce, how to distribute, but still charge a price that your consumers will be able to buy if they like it and they want to consume a lot of it. And all four of these dimensions are supported by sensory information. And I'll allude to that as I go through the, the dairy information. This is probably the most important slide that I, that I show in these sensory workshops. I showed this last year, I'm, I'm gonna remind everybody. We have this thing called the flavor leadership criteria. And the reason I show this is when we do sensory analysis on dairy products, we don't need to measure everything. What we need to measure is what's important. And by that, I mean, we need to measure what's important to the customer and to the end user. And we know what's important across product categories, not just dairy, but any product, all market leading products, food and beverages, have these five things in common. The first one is aromatic identity. How quickly do you taste what you expect? If I'm tasting cheese, I wanna get cheese flavor and dairy and milk and some sour early in the flavor. 
if there's a flavor lag, if I get a little waxy and I don't really get the cheese right away, that's not a good thing. And we call that order of appearance. We're gonna cover that when we start tasting in a minute. The second thing is a very difficult one. We call it amplitude or balance and, and fullness. It's difficult because um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very complex um, attribute to measure because it contains other attributes. Balance is harmony. So is there a blend of flavor or do things stick out? Fullness is complexity. Does it taste thin and watery or does it taste like there's a lot of different things there? And so we're not gonna spend a lot of time on those two things today. I'll be honest with you, when, when we train panelists, there are whole week long courses that we use just to teach those two concepts. But we'll, we'll talk about it as we go through some of the dairy products. Mouthfeel, it has to have a compatible mouthfeel. We're gonna see a lot of mouthfeel discussion when we do dairy products because mouthfeel is a big part of the consumer acceptance of dairy products. So we'll talk about what that means and what the mouthfeels are. Certainly no off flavors. So if, if you buy milk and it's clean, you say, that's great, I'll drink it, no aftertaste. If you go buy 100% grass-fed milk and you get some Barney taste or you get some rubber glove taste or you get some medicinal phenolic taste, then that's not a good thing. That affects consumption and overall liking, which affects market share. And then we have aftertaste. Uh, believe it or not, even with these artisan cheeses and products in the dairy industry that, that people will tell me, craft people, artisans will say, you know, I want a flavor that lingers. I want them to take a bite and it stays with them for a while. The fact of the matter is that when that actually happens, people eat less and use less of that product. And so what we see is, is blossoming of flavor, early intense, early flavor that disappears relatively quickly. So they want to take another bite. They want to eat more. And so we focus on aftertaste and we focus on how quickly the flavor disappears, but also do we develop any off notes in the flavor? On the grass-fed milk project we're doing, that's a big issue. We're seeing things that you don't taste when you're drinking the milk, but within a minute, two minutes, three minutes, you start picking up some off flavor in the aftertaste. And that's gonna drive consumption and success in the market. And I'm gonna teach you with some of the dairy products how to measure some of these criteria today. I mentioned about the nose, that you don't need to be a chemist, but I'll just tell you that there are, there are lots of chemicals in the world that we can smell well below what instruments can pick up in the lab. And this is important because people will say, well, why can't we use chemistry to help understand what consumers like and don't like, or to understand what our product smells and tastes like? We can't use chemistry because the instruments we have don't measure all the things we can smell and taste. So chemistry always gives us an incomplete story. We have to have people that smell and taste. Instruments also don't measure integrative effects. For example, there's sometimes when you have salt in the presence of um, whey or dairy materials or grains that the salt will potentiate the flavor. Meaning that if you, analytically you measured the level, you might have a couple samples that look like they have the same level of milk solids, but one has a much more intense milk solid taste than the other one. And the reason for that is the salt is potentiating the flavor. So instruments don't help with that. We need to train people and have human instruments to objectively measure these things because what we measure does correlate and does mirror with what consumers want and don't want. Um, there's, two, there's four types of sensory. I showed this before. We're not gonna be dealing with hedonic today. Hedonic testing is when you just ask people what they like or don't like. It's very important, we need that data because we wanna correlate against that to figure out what it is they like and what they don't like. Um, but it is effective testing, it's very subjective. There's the, there are these things called difference tests where you don't have to be trained. So you can have, um, you could be a cheese maker and say, look, we normally get milk from this farm, but this week we're getting it from this one. Is it making the cheese taste different? Well, you can set up a difference test and two of the samples are one sample, you know, one from one farm and the third one is from a different one. And you have people smell and taste and say, do you see a difference? They don't have to answer the question, well, why are they different? But just do you see a difference? And then there are statistical programs you can run to say, okay, you know what? We can use the milk from that farm because when we do a triangle test, then people don't see a difference. Um, it's a horrible test to run. And the reason it's a horrible test to run is that there are too many things that can influence the right answer. This type of sensory is very difficult. For example, there might be a slight temperature difference between the two samples. And they're always getting the right one because one's a little bit warmer or a little bit colder. And it fakes you into thinking it's because of the milk you're using, but it's not, it's something different. You know, when we do this with beer, we have to worry about carbonation levels, the color of the beer, 
there are so many things that can that can throw off the results of different tests that we really recommend being very careful if you run them at all. There are expert tasters out there, brewmasters, wine experts. There are cheese tasters and cheese experts. Some of you may be in that group who actually grade cheese. They have enough, enough experience, enough knowledge that they'll go in and grade different types of cheese and say whether it's true to type and where it falls in the grading scale. I'm not, a, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I'm a professional taster who also wears the hat of an expert. I'm an, I'm an expert beer taster because I know a lot about beer. I'm an expert distilled. I do, I am an expert dairy taster, but I'm not an expert cheese taster. Where I fall is what I'm gonna teach you today. It's called descriptive analysis. It's what Heather was trained to do. It's what Sarah was trained to do. It's what other people in our group and at UVM were trained to do, um, which is basically uh, use reference standards to objectively measure sensory characteristics. And so I'm gonna go through a quick review and this is where we're gonna start tasting in, in about 30 seconds. What is descriptive sensory analysis? It's using people as instruments because we can't use the, the analytical instruments in the chem lab. So we wanna use people and use their sense of smell and their sense of taste and their sense of feel to objectively measure the sensory properties of dairy products. So we wanna measure the aroma, we wanna measure the flavor, we wanna measure the texture. And we have, we have to train people because to do it objectively, we have to be on the same page. We have to have the same terminology. We have to use the same uh, intensity scale. Um, and we need a lot of practice working together to make sure that we're measuring things the same way. Last year's conference, I showed a bunch of these types of graphs. This is a graph that came out of our grass-fed milk study that we have going on. Um, these are grass-fed milks that were purchased across the US. Um, and we did sensory using our panel. So this is all objective sensory where we're basically measuring these combination attributes. So this one is aftertaste that involves aftertaste, off notes, mouthfeel, it's a combination. This is richness, which is dairy intensity and fullness of flavor, complexity. And then we can look objectively and say, well, do we see differences across the country? And sure enough, we can see that the stuff from the West and from the, the mid part of the country falls in one place of this map. And the stuff we see in the East has much more uh, variation but falls more on the bottom part of this map than the top. Now, we can take this objective information, it's as if an instrument gave it to us, and now correlate this against things. We can correlate it against, well, what do consumers want? Do they want it to taste like something down here, up here, over here? And once we get the consumer information on what they like and don't like, then we can figure out, well, what makes a sample be up here versus down here? Can we move it? Can we change it? Is it what the cows are eating? Is it where they're, they're hanging out? Is it the exercise they're getting? And that's what our project's doing now. So what I'm teaching you now is the instrumental sensory analysis. It's not liking, don't like, it's not subjectivity, it's not good and bad. It's simply how do I describe dairy products? And so that I can use that information to, to correlate and learn something else. Flavor is made up of three components. This is a review. We have basic taste, aromatics, and mouthfeels. We're gonna start with the basic taste. So this is the point where if you have those solutions, I asked you to make up some sweet, some salt, and some sour. If you haven't, that's fine, just listen along, but have those ready for the basic taste solution. So professional tasters use this term basic taste for specifically what you taste on your tongue. And on your tongue, all of the people have tongues, you have taste buds. And those taste buds are sensitive to classes of chemistry or different groups of compounds, okay? Now, we have five different types of taste buds. We typically focus on four, although for this group, we're gonna add in the fifth one because there are some savory spices used in cheeses and dairy products, and we do get some savoriness. So the five types of taste buds are one, sweet taste buds. These are, these are taste buds that are sensitive to sugars and carbohydrates. Two, we have salty taste buds, things that are sensitive to different salts table salt, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, um, calcium chloride, all different types of salts. We have different taste buds that are for sour. This is for all the acids, acetic acid, you know, vinegar, um, uh, butyric acid, which we find in cheese, isovaleric acid. And then we have taste buds that are sensitive to bitter compounds, things like caffeine um, or, or quinine. There's lots of bitter compounds. And there's a fifth taste bud that we call umami, this is very specifically sensitive to compounds like glutamates, like MSG, or savory spices, things that have mushroom in it or, or other types of savory foods. Now, 
for, for today, we were just gonna look at the ones that were easy to make up at home because most people don't have MSG at home. Most people don't have straight caffeine at home. So I asked you to make up some sweet, some salty and some sour just to, just to verify that your tongue's working and to see um, how it works. So what I would ask you to do is, um, so I move back. Uh, if you could take the sweet solutions and you should have a sweet one and a sweet two. The sweet one was the less sugar one. And I would stick the tip of your tongue in there and see if you pick up something. And when you stick the tip of your tongue in there, you should pick up a very low level of sweet. Now, we're not gonna have time to get into the intensity scale today. So I'm gonna use three terms from our seven point scale, slight, moderate, and strong. So this first cup is what we would call a slight amount. It should be sweet, it should be there, it should be noticeable, but it's low. We call that slight. Now, if you taste that second cup I had you made up, make up, we would call that a moderate level. So a little bit more pronounced, a little bit more easy to pick up, but not overwhelming. There's no wow factor. Had I had you make up a, a third cup, it would have a sweetness level of something like preserves or grape jellies, things that are really sweet. Usually things that we call strong is a little bit of a wow factor, it gets your attention. We see that sometimes with dairy products, some of the, we call it the stinky cheese aromatic or some of the different aromatics can get to a strong level. In fact, one of the yogurts that I tasted, I'll talk about had a strong level of, uh, of something. So sweets on the tip of the tongue. Now, this diagram is a little bit confusing because the title says, where are they perceived? Not where do you have those taste buds? You have sweet taste buds all across your tongue, but the way that your tongue is wired to your brain, we tend to, to detect sweet taste buds on the tip of your tongue more than the rest of your tongue, okay? This becomes important because when we start tasting dairy products, one of the things you're gonna notice is very often we get the sweet taste early in the flavor, and then we get bitter and sour a little bit later. And this is really a geographic occurrence. It's because of where we tend to perceive those tastes on the tongue. So the second set of cups I asked you to make up, we'll do salty. I asked you to um, make up a salty one and a, and a salty two. Do the same thing, taste the salty one. Now salty is kind of all over the tongue even though we have salty taste buds everywhere. And that first solution you made up should be a slight level. It should be there, you shouldn't question it, but it's not quite as salty as a can of soup yet. Definitely not as salt as say soy sauce. Okay, this level of salt is kind of like the salt level in peanut butter, the salt level in a saltine cracker that's, that doesn't have salt on the top. And then you can go ahead and try the second solution to see what a moderate level would be. And if you made the solutions up, I really would like you to think about the difference in intensity because as we get into the, the dairy products, intensity of the different things we're gonna talk about becomes very important. And there is a big difference between having a slight level, which is that first cup of these and having a moderate level. Most market leading products have a moderate level of identifiable flavor. So that's an intensity we're trying to shoot for. And it's not, it's not true to say, but we want more than that because the segment of consumers that will consume that goes down dramatically. There are people that like very strong flavor, but the segment is small. The big segments for cheese, for milk, for yogurt, for ice cream are the ones that want moderate level of flavor. And then of course, in dairy products, we have this third basic taste that we, we need to think about, which is sour. And I asked you to use a little bit of vinegar. Um, it's a little bit tricky to do this with people at home because it depends on what type of vinegar you use. Depends how old that vinegar was. The acetic acid will break down a little bit over time. Um, so this one may be a little bit off, but again, if you taste the vinegar one and then taste your vinegar uh, two, the second cup, you should see a difference in intensity. The first one should be there, be obvious, but it's low. And the second one should be a little bit more eye-opening, but not strong yet. Not like tasting straight vinegar. Straight vinegar would be a, a strong, a three. Now, the other thing you get with the sour is mouthfeel. And we're gonna, we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about mouthfeel in this workshop. And in this case, sour does two things. It makes you pucker. We call that astringent mouthfeel. Astringent mouthfeel is extremely important for dairy products. And it doesn't matter if it's cheese or milk or yogurt, we need to have some level of astringent mouthfeel in there. 
It helps with eatability and drinkability. The second thing that sour does is makes you salivate. You form more saliva. That's also very important, especially if it's a solid, if it's cheese. We need to have some salivation. The good news is salivation is also uh, driven by salty. So whether we have sour in the cheese or sour in the dairy product or salty, we can create some of that, some of that um, salivating mouthfeel. Now, those of you who were there last year, remember this part where we say it, we tell people who don't know already that those five things that I just went over, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, those five things are the only thing you taste in your mouth. Everything else that we taste when we evaluate dairy products, other than mouthfeel, but everything else that we say we taste, we can't taste in our mouth because we don't have anything in the mouth to taste milk, to taste cheese, to taste butter flavor, to taste barney, to taste um, vanilla in ice cream. All of those things, we have to use a different instrument. We can't taste them in the mouth. And so I want to do a little demonstration here. If you could pull out um, if you got yourself a mint or a lifesaver, I have myself a little lifesaver. If you could pull that out. And what I'd like you to do is take that lifesaver. Let's go down here. Take it out of the package or the mint. And it, we do this together. If you could hold your nose and don't let your nose go until I say so, I want you to lick that bit. Now, when I'm licking my mint, not to let my nose go, I don't taste a lot. I'm getting a little bit of sweet, maybe a little bit of sour. Okay. Take a couple more licks. Now let your nose go. Now, this is really strange because when I do this in a big group, usually it's like fireworks and I hear people go, ooh, ah, that's, that's cool. Because what happens when you let your nose go? Well, all of a sudden you taste whatever the flavor of that mint was. In my case, I tasted wintergreen because my lifesaver was wintergreen. So as soon as I let my nose go, I got wintergreen flavor in addition to the sweet and the sour. If you use peppermint or you use spearmint or you use some other mint, then what should have happened is when you hold your nose, you only taste sweet, you only taste things you can perceive on your tongue, you let your nose go, voila, you taste whatever that was, peppermint, spearmint, double mint. Now, why does that happen? Well. These things, unlike basic tastes that we taste on the tongue, these we call aromatics. And we are detecting these up here in what's called the olfactory region of the nose. Now, the chemistry or the compounds or the odor can get to that olfactory area two ways. One way is smelling through your nose. So when you, when you pick something up and smell it, or if you go out on a beautiful day like today and you start smelling roses or, or um, you know, wherever you are, if you go to a bakery and you smell fresh bakery, all of that flavor chemistry is going up your nose into the olfactory area. We call them aromatics because they are perceived by the nose. But there's a second way that they can get there. And the second way is all of those smells, those odors, those flavors that you can't perceive on your tongue because you can only taste sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami on your tongue. Well, they have to travel up what's called the retronasal passage or the back of your throat to get to that same place where you actually smell those things. So what happened when we just that, did our thing was by holding our nose, we are preventing air to travel from our mouth cavity up that pathway into the olfactory area so that you could smell the taste. In my case, so that I could smell the wintergreen. In your case, it might be peppermint or spearmint or, some, or cinnamon or something else. Now, this is a really great technique. When we do dairy products, if we want to do a measurement, how sour is it? How sweet is it really? Because there's a lot of aromatic sweet. There's very little sweet on the tongue. All we have to do is hold our nose. Anytime you hold your nose, you will blank out on everything in the flavor except sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. And so I'll do the quick, real quick exercise that we did last year just to prove this. If you were able to get gumdrops, I had put that on the list. For those of you who did, I'm going to take out my purple gumdrop. And if we were all in the room together, I would ask you, what do you think purple is going to taste like? And many of you would say grape or blueberry or something that's purple or blue. I, I ask everybody to take, which if you don't have a purple gumdrop or you're using different candy, take whatever piece of candy you have 
and hold your nose. Don't let your nose go and bite the candy. You have to chew that candy up really good because for the basic taste, it has to go in your saliva and go out to your tongue. While I'm chewing my candy, I'm not tasting anything except sweet, okay? Let my nose go. Again, what should happen is you should now taste the flavor. In my case, if you bought these same gumdrops at Walmart, this uh, great value brand, it's a brown spice, you should be tasting clove. We can't taste clove on the tongue. You have to smell clove. And so if you hold your nose, you're gonna blank out and not get the clove, okay? Um, the other thing I always like to point out at, at this point is we don't do flavor by eye. So I asked, I asked you, if you were in the room with me, if you had a purple candy, what do you think it would taste like? And people say grape and blueberry, but it doesn't, it tastes like clove. And this is a big, big thing we have to teach our human instruments is how to separate themselves from what they see and actually just measure what they, what they smell and what they taste and what they feel. Try not to be influenced because you can get fooled all the time. One cheese could be a darker color than another cheese and yet doesn't have as much uh, intensity of flavor or isn't as salty or doesn't have as much uh, milk flavor to it. Um, so we have to be careful. In the case of beer work, one beer is darker than another beer doesn't mean it has more flavor. So we, we try to separate what we see from what we taste. Now, there are situations that I work in and that you may find yourself in where you do have to jump out of being a, an instrument and think about what things look like. So I teach classes from time to time at Johnson & Wales Culinary School, primarily for the, for the faculty, for the, for the chefs. If you were a chef, if you're a culinary person, then you do have to factor in what things look like with this descriptive uh, data. So you have to say, okay, what do consumers want things to smell and taste like? Okay, what does that really mean? Let's create objective data to define that. But now, what does it need to look like that makes them think it's gonna have that flavor? So if it's orange juice, well, unless it's St. Patrick's Day, we can't have green orange juice, it needs to be orange. Or if it's beer, it needs to be clear, it needs to be cloudy. All right, let's do a couple more of these. We don't have to do them all, but let's try, if you have a yellow gumdrop or if you have a different piece of candy, either way, I'm gonna do my yellow one. I'm gonna hold my nose, take a bite. Let it go. Again, it happens. In my case, I just had, was getting sweet. I let my nose go and now I'm getting uh, artificial cinnamon like dentine gum or big, big red fireballs. Um, and you can finish the gumdrops if you, if you have these. Well, I can tell you, uh, well, let's do one more. If you, if you bought these ones, do the red one. Why not? Right. And again, it happened to me. If I did the red one, it's not strawberry, it's not cherry. I don't taste it when I hold my nose. I let my nose go and I get anise. So like Zambuca or Ouzo, or if you like candy, black jelly beans, black licorice, anisette cookies. I promise you that no matter what you're tasting, if you hold your nose, you will only taste sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. And everything else will be blanked out until you let your nose go. And then poof, you will smell coffee, hot chocolate, tea, hops and, and fruit from beer, um, it, uh, steak, grilled chicken. It doesn't matter. You can't taste any of those things in your mouth. You have to smell them. This is why when people have a cold that um, they often say, look, I can't taste anything this week because I'm so congested. Um, nothing's getting in my nose. And what they really mean is I can still taste sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Trust me, if you have a bitter medicine that has a fruit flavor in it, you hold your nose, you won't taste the fruit, but that bitter will be 10 times worse, okay? So when we're doing dairy products, no matter what they are, if we wanna focus on sour or sweet or bitter or salty or umami, one of the techniques that we use is hold our nose for a minute, drink it, taste it, record what we have, and then let our nose go. So that way it helps us to separate what we're perceiving for basic taste from everything else that's in our aromatic. And one of the things we're gonna find with dairy products is that Many people will say that dairy products are sweet. Milk is sweet, cheese is sweet, um, 
yogurt is, is sweet, when in fact those products in general aren't very sweet, they're not sweet on the tongue, it's what we call a sweet aromatic. They're smelling vanilla or they're smelling some of the cheese aromatics or they're smelling buttery caramelized things. They're what we call sweet aromatics. It's not sweet on the tongue. And it's very important for us to differentiate that. Okay, the next um, category that I wanna talk about, because we talked about basic taste on the tongue, um, aromatics in the nose. We have a couple more categories and then we're gonna get to those dairy products. The next category is what we call mouthfeel. So I asked you on the list to have some of these things. You could have cranberry juice. You might've had some applesauce in your house, uh, black tea, beer, IPA works the best, or something with some you know, spiciness to it, either spicy mustard or one of these uh, sauces, depending what your toleration is for heat. Um, because now we're gonna talk about the third category, which is mouthfeel. So we had basic taste on the tongue. We use our taste buds. Everything else is aromatics in the nose, the clove, the cinnamon. In this case, it's going to be buttery, creamy, cheesy, uh, barney, rubber glove. All of these things that we're picking up are, are aromatics. But then we have this thing that we call mouthfeel, and it literally is, how does your mouth feel? Now, as tasters, we don't need to be able to differentiate if something is a physical mouthfeel versus a chemical. And what I mean by that is, a physical mouthfeel would be you eat a piece of bread, like on the screen here, and when you eat that piece of bread, your mouth feels dry, and we would say dry mouthfeel. Well, it's a physical mouthfeel because we are physically removing saliva, and that's why your mouth feels dry. Now, we have chemical mouthfeels, and those are the ones we actually worry about more. Chemical mouthfeels are like hot peppers, where there's a compound or compounds in the hot pepper or in the product that are somehow chemically reacting with your mouth. They're either um, digesting proteins or, or burning things. Um, capsation is one of those compounds. And so it's actually a, a chemical reaction versus something that's just physical. And mouthfeels are critical in all food and beverages, but perhaps dairy is one of the top categories for mouthfeels for us to be aware of. And the reason for that is we need some level of mouthfeel, and I'm going to define what those mouthfeels are in a bit. But if we get too high, then overall liking, consumption, sales, all those things start to go down. So we need to be able to measure mouthfeels and measure the intensity of those mouthfeels in order to make sure that we're delivering products that people want to consume, consume often, and consume a lot of. These are some mouthfeels that we're going to practice with. I talked about astringency, which is puckering. Dry and tannin, we'll talk about that in a, in a second. This oily, greasy coating is something that comes from fats and oils. We do get mouth coatings and things in dairy products. We're going to see that in, in some of the products. Um, irritation can be anything from bite and burn and, and to this harshness um, to just small amounts of irritation that really aren't that painful, but are just are uncomfortable enough that it makes you want to either spit the product out or swallow it. It's uncomfortable holding it in your mouth. And there are some cheeses like that where, where it's something about the cheese that causes this tongue sting or the throat burn. And it's not really high, but it's enough that people can't really spend as long as they want chewing on it or having it in their mouth because there's some irritation. So we need to be, be able to measure those things. And then there's cooling. And we normally think about cooling coming from mints, things like menthol. But I'll tell you that we can find cooling in dairy products. And, and Heather and the team will tell you that even in these grass-fed milk samples, it's, this, it's a strange thing that there are times where we'll taste a sample and late in the flavor and then the aftertaste, you get a little bit of a cooling mouthfeel. Now, what could that be? Well, there's lots of things that I've run into. One category of compounds are compounds that cause musty taste. So there are, there are things that come from algae, things that come from uh, uh, forage, things that come from soil. There are compounds like jasmine and methyl isoborneol for anybody out there that's a chemist. These compounds are not that different chemically from things like camphor. And that's why they tend to, to cause a little bit of this cooling. So we find cooling in milk sometimes. So let's start with these two products. So if you have cranberry juice or applesauce, I would encourage you, let's talk about cranberry juice first if you happen to have any cranberry juice. So if you go ahead and pour it yourself, and I've already tasted these, so I'm not gonna redo it, I'll just talk. Um, if you taste a little bit of that cranberry juice, um, you should notice a couple things. First of all, from an aromatic standpoint, you should pick up 
fruitiness, breadfruit, cranberries. Okay? All of that is in the nose. If you were to hold your nose, what you should pick up are the basic taste, which are sour. This has a moderate level of sour. Sweet, you should be picking up a slight to moderate level of sweet. I think it's more moderate uh, in ocean spray and that's intentional. Um, you pick up a little bit of bitterness in the back of your throat and that's coming from the skins of the cranberries. You let your nose go, you get the, you get the cooked cranberry, but then you get mouthfeels. And when you taste cranberry juice, you should get the two mouthfeels, two of the three mouthfeels we saw already that were coming from sour. You should get the puckering. That's a stringent mouthfeel. In juices, that is desirable. It makes it, consumers like that puckering if it's a juice. You should also get salivating. Anytime things have sour, you typically salivate. So your, your mouth waters. But in this cranberry juice, after you finish tasting and you wait a few seconds, you should also get dry mouth feel. All over your mouth, it should start to dry out. And that's coming from some of the compounds in the, in the skins of the cranberry. Now, when we developed this, I, I helped to develop this product and set up a program for Ocean Spray. We were very concerned with all three of those sensory dimensions. And it's gonna be the same with dairy products. We had to understand customers, what basic taste did they want and how much? And what we heard from customers for cranberry juices, we want some sweet and sour, but we want it about balanced. And we want it to be there. We don't want slight, we want it moderate. And we want cranberry flavor, but we, want, we don't want raw, resinous cranberry. We want it cooked. We want a little bit of cooked cranberry. So that was the aromatic. And then what we found out, and they don't tell us this, is when we start to monitor what they drink and how much, we found that if there was a little bit of dryness, it caused them to want to drink more. And if that dryness went away, they drank less of the juice. Now, if it's too dry, they don't drink as much. And we're gonna have the same discussion with dairy products, that there are certain mouthfeels that we need to have a little bit of to get people to drink more of it, but we don't want too much because it'll affect how much they drink. So in this case with cranberry juice, we have two mouth, three mouthfeels, astringent puckering, salivation, and dry mouthfeel. Now, if you had the applesauce, it's a very similar discussion. So if you taste the applesauce, if you hold your nose in applesauce, um, this one is actually highly segmented. So consumers will say, I want sweet, sour, balanced. People that like sweeter apples will say, I want my applesauce a little sweeter than sour. And people that prefer sour, more sour apples want their applesauce a little more sour than sweet. So applesauce companies in general will, will produce different types of applesauce to meet those segments. The number one segment, which the brand leader meets, is balanced, sour and sweet. It's a little bit disjointed, but balanced. Now, when you taste applesauce, you get multiple mouthfeels, okay? Um, you should get sour, depending on how sour the apples were and how they processed it. You should get sweet. You may get some bitter. The bitterness in applesauce is coming from the seeds. Some of the seeds make it in there and the seeds contribute bitter compounds. Um, and then for mouthfeels, you should get some puckering if it's sour. You should get some salivation. You also should get what we call particulate mouthfeel. So in this case, you get a sensation that, that applesauce is leaving little pieces of apple in your teeth or in your, your cheeks, okay? Now, because we're describing what's happening in our mouth, it, it's a mouthfeel. We're gonna see this when we taste some yogurts. Some yogurts have little pieces in it or, or little pieces of fruit in it. And if you get the sense that you can, you can detect that in your mouth. There's little pieces stuck in your teeth or in your mouth and they get, they get stuck there. We're gonna call it, we're gonna call it particulate mouthfeel. But this is a good opportunity to describe texture because we're also gonna talk about texture, especially when it comes to cheese. And the difference between a mouthfeel and a texture is when you're measuring mouthfeel, you're describing your mouth. My mouth is dry, my mouth is puckering, my mouth is forming saliva. My mouth feels like it has little pieces in it. My mouth burns, my mouth, if it starts with my mouth, it's a mouthfeel. But if what you're really doing is describing the product, for example, if I were to say, this applesauce tastes like it has pieces in it. I'm describing the product, now it becomes a texture. So when we get to cheese and we're gonna say things like, this cheese is easy to bite down on. It's not dense, this cheese is dense. This cheese is chewy, this cheese is mushy. This cheese is crumbly. Um, this milk is thick. This yogurt 
is thin or this yogurt is thick. This yogurt is easy to stir. Anytime we start the sentence with the product, so we're, we're describing the product, it's going to be a texture. With dairy products, especially with cheese and yogurt, texture is going to be a very important thing to measure. And if we start the sentence with my mouth is, then that goes in what we call the flavor profile. That's part of the flavor. Texture is always considered a separate measurement, although we are going to talk about it in measure. Hey, Roy, yep. can I, um, somebody had a question. And I think I would encourage folks again, because you can unmute yourselves. Um, you're welcome to unmute and ask Roy a question. So the question here is when you're tasting, do you hold your nose or not initially for all the items that might be on the tasting men menu? Or do you want to have the experience of the basic taste and the aromatic at the same time um, and just be of, aware of where they're coming from? Yeah, this, this, I'm not sure who asked this question, but this is a great question. And, and I do want to clarify. I, I asked this, it, it's Susan. Okay. Hi, Susan. Um, so for this, I'll, I'll answer it with a couple of different ways. For this, for this workshop, I do not want you to hold your nose unless I, unless I tell you to hold your nose. For the reason that you just said in your question, for most of these products, unless I ask you to hold your nose, especially when we get to the dairy products, I do want you to experience the combination effect. I want you to experience everything as it comes together, the aromatics, the mouthfeel, the basic taste. My point is that if for some reason we want to focus on one of those particular you know, areas of flavor and texture, holding our nose is one way to allow us to focus on something. But typically consumers and customers don't hold their noses. And we're going to get into this discussion in a few minutes as well. So in general, the way that we taste as professional tasters is we taste as the consumer would. And, and that gets into technique. Sometimes it's just sipping things. Sometimes it's chewing on things. Sometimes it's slurping from a spoon. Whatever the customer's doing, that's what we wanna do. And so if a customer's not holding his nose, well, we wanna know what they're experiencing. And there are, there are effects that happen. There are synergistic effects. There are times when you know, things are more blended or things won't stick out or will stick out because you're, you're not holding your nose and they have, a, they have an ability to balance each other out. So I would say for this, for the rest of this session, if, if I mentioned to you, okay, you may want to hold your nose because you can see this or see that, then go ahead and hold your nose. But the intent here is when we get to the dairy products, especially um, that we're not going to hold our noses, that we're just going to taste like we're the average consumer or customer. So, your, jo so your job as the professional taster is, is, is to replicate the experience of the general consuming public? I, that is another great question because I have a slide for that in a few minutes. Okay, I'll, um, I'll hold that. No, 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 no. This is a great time to answer it. The, the answer is you are correct the majority of the time. The majority of the time we want to taste just like the customer's tasting, preparing the sample the same way the customer does um, and evaluating it the same way the customer does. There are times when we don't do that. And I'm going to talk about that before we get into the dairy products. But you, you are correct that, and, and you'll see why, and it'll, I think it'll make sense when we get to that slide. Thanks very much. Yep, yeah, and everybody, please. I mean, the group's small enough that we can um, answer questions as we go along. All right, so astringent, puckering, dry, salivating, those were the mouthfeels from these products. So now if you have black tea or beer, I'm hoping you all have beer because it's one of my favorite products. Um, I don't have beer, I use black tea, but I'm, I'm well aware of both of these. So whichever product you have, what I want you to do is, and you don't need to hold your nose, I want you to get the aromatics, it's not gonna affect the mouthfeel. I want you to go ahead and taste either the black tea or the beer, taste it, make sure you let it cross your tongue and swallow. And by the way, majority of the work that we do as professionals, we have to swallow what we're tasting. The only time we don't swallow is if we're working on pharmaceutical products and there's, a, there's an issue with active ingredients and we have health concerns. But for the most part, Heather mentioned, we're working on um, distilled natural spirits right now, 190 proof, and we still have to taste a little and swallow, which is a very painful thing. But the reason we're doing that is we wanna make sure we cover the whole tongue. We also have um, uh, this thing that happens in the aftertaste where stuff can come back up from your lungs and affect what your perceptions are from a sensory standpoint. So I want you to taste a little bit of your tea, taste a little bit of your beer, 
wait uh, two, three, four, five seconds and see how your tongue feels. And what should happen is as you sit there, your tongue should dry out, especially with the tea. With the beer, it depends how much hops is in there. But if you got a really good, you know, hoppy IPA, really high hop, it will do the same thing. Um, the applesauce could have done it a little bit too. There's a little bit of tannin in that applesauce, but it should be drying out your tongue. And some people describe it as my tongue is like sandpaper. It's rough. I have rough tongue. That's a very specific type of dry mouthfeel that we call tannin. Now, we don't see a lot of tannin in milk and, and most milk products. Um, we don't see it in yogurts typically, although it can occur. We do see this dry tongue when it comes to cheeses. Okay, so it is gonna be one of those mouthfeels that we're focusing on. But, but we can also just say dry, but if we think we're getting that sandpaper, that rough tongue, um, it's, it's caused by tannins, natural tannins. Um, it's caused by carbonates. Um, there's a bunch of uh, compounds that get into that come from natural sources that come, you know, from tea leaves or hops or hemp or, you know, in, in the case of uh, milk solids, some milk solids. Now, let's go into the last one so I can get moving on here. Um, you should, I asked you to, to see if you had something available that was a little bit on the spicy side, either spicy mustard or one of these sauces. Be careful if you're not used to tasting some of those sauces directly, just be careful. Uh, don't want you to have an uncomfortable experience. But if you can go ahead and, and taste a little bit of the spicy mustard or taste one of those sauces. And what we're trying to show here is irritation. And irritation gets described in a bunch of different ways. It could be severe bite and burn. It, it's painful. You know, if you, if you taste a ghost pepper or I had, some, I had some real tiny peppers. I tell the story I probably told it last year in Taiwan that almost, almost took my head off. They were so painful. But irritation ranges from just unbearable pain all the way down to just a little bit of irritation that I described earlier where we say, you know, it doesn't really hurt, but I just don't want to keep it in my mouth. It's just uncomfortable. I either want to swallow it or I want to spit it out. And we call that harsh mouthfeel. And for the most part, uh, food and beverage products, consumers don't like pain. Okay, We don't want any level of irritation. Now, there are some exceptions and the flavor leadership criteria when I went over them, we said compatible mouthfeel. Certainly if you're making things like mustard or you're making these hot sauces, you know, these are things where it is part of the trueness to type or the, the product uh, profile and it is a compatible mouthfeel, but you have to have it at the right level. Now, when we get to dairy products, it depends. It depends. In general, for, for the, what I call the biggies, the, the main milk market, the main cheese market, um, they don't like irritation. No matter what anybody says, they don't like irritation. Now, there are some products that are designed to have some irritation. One of the cheeses I'm going to use in a minute that I got is a, it's a maple sriracha cheese. And the sriracha is noticeable and there is the mouthfeel, the bite and burn. Um, but I'll talk about that when I get there. But that, and that is a quote unquote, if I do the translation, good thing, because someone that sees that and says, okay, it's got sriracha in it, is expecting like these sauces, like the mustard, to get some of that spice burn. And so the trick for that company is to figure out, all right, if we wanted to deliver to their expectations, what type of spice irritation should it be and how strong should it be? And so we need to do sensory to describe those things. In this case, we call it a bunch of different things. There's bite, there's burn, there's sting, there's tongue sting, throat sting. Um, some people will say warming. And then if there's, some people just say irritation, there's a slight irritation, it's an okay word to use. And some people will use this word in my Boston accent, I'll say harsh, or up here in Vermont, I have to say harsh. Um, and that means it's uncomfortable. It's not really hurting me. It's not stinging me. It's just uncomfortable. And I, I just can't hold it in my mouth very long. And we find that with a lot of cheeses. In fact, when we start looking, we're, we're going to do whatever samples you got today. But if you start to really um, experiment with the artisan cheeses up here, you'll notice that there are a bunch of them that have this harsh, harsh mouthfeel. And it's one of the things we're gonna be looking at. Heather mentioned that we're kicking off a, a state funded project this Friday, looking at artisan cheese. And one of the things we're gonna be looking at is this, in addition to the aromatics and the basic taste, we're gonna be looking at this particular mouthfeel because 
when I, in my previous life, I was at Tufts University, we did some work with artisan cheese and we found that this harsh mouthfeel was being influenced by the particular combination of microbes that were being used to make the cheese. And so what we're trying to do in our project is not just connect uh, what consumers want to what the cheese tastes and smell like, but to work with the cheese manufacturers and the microbes to see what the microbes are doing to influencing these things that are causing people to like it or not. So it's a, it's a slightly different project than the grass-fed milk, but along the same lines. Okay, so those are the mouthfeels. So we had basic taste on the tongue. We had aromatics up in the nose. We have lots of mouthfeels. Uh, we're gonna review all of those now when we get to the, to the milk and the cheese, but we have to put it all together. And what I'd like you to do, if you got a Tic Tac or a mint, if you could pull that out now, um, I actually lied because I'm going to use a green one, not a white one. So I have a winter green one. But if you could pull it out, but don't taste it yet. Because what I want to do is talk about order of appearance. So if everybody has it out, what I'd like to do is do this at the same time. So when I say go, I'd like you to put that Tic Tac or that mint or whatever you have in your mouth. Okay? So go ahead and put it in. I put mine in, I get some sweet on the tongue. I also get some sweet in the nose, some vanilla. Okay, now I'm not chewing it, I'm just letting it sit in my mouth. I'm starting to pick up wintergreen flavor and I'm starting to get some cooling. So I started with sweet, basic taste. I got an aromatic, the wintergreen. Now I'm getting a little bit of the cooling. I'm starting to pick up some sour, another basic taste. The cooling is getting stronger. We call that building. And you're gonna see in one of these, I, I have a result that says something was building. Now it's not only cooling, but my, my mouth is heating up. I'm getting some warming, which is a mouth fail. Okay. And then I'm starting to get a little bit of bitter. Okay. Now you can finish eating that or, or not. I'm gonna take mine out. So what we just did is we, we exaggerated by using that Tic Tac, um, and I would have given you all a Tic Tac if we were together, by using the, the physical di uh, dissolving of the Tic Tac. So you put it in your mouth, you're getting the outside coating, you get some sweet, basic taste. Also in the coating is a little bit of vanilla. You pick that up, that's in the nose, an aromatic. Then as that coating starts to melt and you get to the inside mint, you start to pick up the wintergreen or the peppermint. This one has both because the peppermint has menthol, which starts to give me a mouthfeel, cooling. The more it dissolves and the concentration goes up in my mouth, the cooling gets more intense, I get more warming. And then as it dissolves further, I end up with a little bit of bitter. We call this order of appearance. It's the order in which we detect odor and flavor characteristics. So I am focusing in this workshop almost entirely on what we call flavor, which is put it in your mouth. We could very easily be doing the smell and the taste but when we do the smell, we're just focusing on the aromatics. We can't get the mouthfeel and the basic taste. And when you smell those aromatics, pretty much you should taste it when you get in your mouth. There are some exceptions because the basic taste and mouthfeels can mask some aromatics. But I will tell you that over 95% of what drives consumer acceptance is what goes in the mouth, with one exception. If there is a moderate or higher level um, off note or something that they don't expect in there. In other words, you open up a container of milk and it smells like sour milk. In that case, aroma is gonna influence what they do. But as far as, as one product versus another, when they're fresh and getting market share and, and optimizing flavor, over 95% of what drives overall liking and repeat purchase and consumption for consumers is what happens in the mouth. So we tend to spend most of our time tasting things and not a lot on smelling. And Heather and, and Sarah and the group will tell you that on these milk panels we're running now, we are doing a little bit of aroma work, but it doesn't tell us much and, it, and we don't pick up much. It's more when you put it in your mouth. Well, whether you're smelling or tasting, there's always a progression of what you are uh, perceiving. We call that progression order of appearance. So if I gave you a piece of milk chocolate and you taste that milk chocolate, you're gonna get sweet. And then if it's a good chocolate, if it's one that's a market leader, very early in the flavor, you'll get cocoa and chocolate and dairy and no off flavor. And then maybe you get some creamy coating in the mouthfeel, but it comes in a certain sequence and we call that order of appearance. 
when the order of appearance gets disrupted, so for example, in grass-fed milk, 100% grass-fed milk, the order of appearance gets disrupted when some of the Barney notes and some of the off notes are high enough, it suppresses some of the dairy note or it delays how you perceive it. And so consumers can't tell you that order of appearance is important to them, but when we correlate it against their liking numbers, we clearly know one of those five criteria that consumers want whatever dairy product they're consuming to taste like what they expect right away. Put it in their mouth, it should taste like the cheese they expected or the milk they expected or the yogurt they expected. And so we as professionals have to be able to measure the order. What comes in when? Is there a flavor lag in some of these things? Now, the other thing that happens is a term we call aftertaste. So on our, on our grass-fed milk panel that we're running now, and most of the panels we run, we define aftertaste as one minute after you took your last taste. And for some products, we'll go to some more time intervals. So for the grass-fed milk, we started with one minute, but realized that in some of these grass-fed milks, we were getting this barniness or this phenolic medicinal beyond one minute. And so we changed our score sheet. We now measure one minute after the last taste. We also measure three minutes after the last taste. And I'll tell you in some of the cheese work I've done in the past, we go out to five minutes after the last taste. So after taste is a measurement in time. Everybody has to wait at the same time. We have a, a clock that we time ourselves and I'll give a heads up to the panel and say, okay, take your last taste now. I'm starting the timer. And then no one tastes anymore and they don't drink any water and they don't eat crackers. They just wait. And then at one minute, they rescore the flavor that's left in their mouth. And then they continue to wait. They don't drink water. They don't have a cracker. They don't, you know, nothing goes in their mouth until they're done with all of their aftertaste. Um, and then at three minutes, I'll say, okay, three minutes, do your final one. And they measure intensity of aftertaste. And in the case of grass-fed milk, we're measuring off notes and mouthfeel as two separate measures. So aftertaste is a measure um, of what's left in your mouth a certain period after your last taste. And aftertaste, I told you in the flavor leadership criteria, is another one of those things that, um, oh, I'm just looking, we're almost at two o'clock. I thought I had till 2.30. I gotta move this along. But it's another one of those things that drives consumer pre preference. Balance and harmony is, um, balance is harmony, meaning the thing is blended, not a lot sticks out. Fullness is complexity, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on complexity um, and harmony today. I'll talk about it. So now we're gonna taste the dairy products. We're gonna finish up with these dairy products. And if you have questions, if you need to leave it to, please jump in and ask questions because I'm watching the clock and I was uh, forgot again that it was ending it too. So have these products in front of you. We're gonna start with milk. And I asked you to, to get four different milks um, to show you how, how looking at these objective measurements helps us to understand dairy products. So how do you prepare and evaluate the products? This goes back to Susan's questions. The first thing you have to ask yourself, no matter, no matter who you are and what you're producing, is a very simple question. Why am I tasting? Why are we tasting? And it really falls into three buckets. There are quality assurance type reasons to taste. I just wanna make sure it tastes right, that it's what I always produce, that there's nothing wrong with it, there's nothing off in it. It's quality assurance. A second reason that we taste and do sensory and dairy products is research and development. We might be developing a new product. We might be optimizing an existing product, or we might be doing a different type of innovation where we're changing around how, how we process it or how we package it or how we do something. The third reason that we taste is to solve a problem. Usually it's because someone complained, either a customer or a vendor. You know, sometimes the vendor complains to the people saying, hey, that wasn't my fault that your thing doesn't taste good. Um, and we have to do some work to figure it out. Or, or sometimes problem solving is a result of something that fails in quality assurance. There's this, there's this metric called right first time. So someone does quality assurance says, wait a second, that yogurt doesn't taste like what it normally tastes like. Now we have to do sensory to figure out what's wrong with it. And so basically it's very simple. If we're doing quality assurance and R&D, we want to taste the products just like the customer would. We want to do it at the same temperature. We want to do it the same way. We want to do the same size of sample. We want to mix it with things. If we're doing milk and a customer is saying, you know, hey, yeah, we use that milk all the time on cornflakes. Well, maybe part of our QA is putting the milk on cornflakes and see what it tastes like. So what we want to do for QA and R&D is we really want to mimic whatever our customer is doing 
to make sure we're having the same experience they are. And that's also as far as technique. So we're not holding our nose. We're not doing anything different than a consumer would do other than the majority of the taste we do as professionals is called sip tasting. We're just taking small amounts. There is another type of sensory I'm not calling today, uh, calling um, descriptive volume, where you actually have to drink a whole glass of milk or eat a whole piece of cheese. And you measure the different sensory characteristics at points in time while you're drinking that volume or while you're eating that piece of cheese. But in general, most of the, the sensory done in the world is this sip testing or small piece. And for quality assurance R&D, we wanna do just like our customer. When we get a problem, that's where things change. If someone says, well, there's a musty taste, there's a, there's a bacon taste, there's something in there that's gonna be there. Well, now all bets are off. The first thing we do is taste it like the consumer did to make sure we can see the problem that they're getting, to just confirm it. Say, yeah, we get the same thing you're getting. Let us try to figure it out. Now, once we confirm that there's an issue, now we wanna stress the sample to try to give ourselves the best opportunity possible to figure out what's going on. So stressing the sample means a lot of things. Uh, in the case of uh, neutral spirits and distilled spirits, we stress samples by diluting them. We want to dilute out that alcohol bite and burn and the ethanol that overwhelms everything and try to get it diluted enough that we can pick up the off note easier to try to describe it and figure it out. We change the temperature of things. Anytime you heat temperature up, odors come up. Sometimes we concentrate things because they're too dilute. So we have to concentrate it down to try to get the off note to be higher. Um, in the case of cheese, it's all about surface area. The more you slice up the cheese, the higher the intensity aroma gives us a better chance to find things that are wrong. So for the most part, we taste like customers do. If we're trying to solve a problem, we'll come up with something a little different. Um, this one last note on this slide though, we do have to standardize everything. We wanna make sure that everyone is doing it the same way. So I can't be you know, chewing something up and spitting it out and somebody else doesn't chew and swallow. Um, I can't be eating you know, a half a pound a piece of cheese and someone just has a couple little crumbles. So we have to standardize what everyone's doing and how they're doing. They have to be at the same temperature. Okay, so now let's talk about the milk first. So I asked you to get some, some milk samples and you can taste along. I'm gonna talk about the samples that I had. These were just store brand samples and give you an indication of when I did the sensory on these samples and you can taste your samples while I'm talking, what kinds of things I'm looking for and what kind of words. Now, terminology is all over the board out on the internet. So you need, to, you need to really look at some um, reputable sites like ASTM, the American Society of Testing Materials. Um, I can give you recommendations on terminology. My suggestion is that as a group, you just taste products and agree to what terms you're gonna use so that you can be consistent. Now this fat-free sample was very thin and watery, meaning it, it wasn't very complex. Now I'm tasting all of these samples cold. And the reason I'm doing that is because that's what most customers do with milk. They drink it cold. By the time you get it out of the refrigerator, put it in a glass, you know, if it's six ounces, eight ounces, it's going to stay between 44 and 48 degrees. But you might change that. You may, your customers might be drinking a little warmer and you might decide to go warmer. So when I taste this milk, and again, I'm going to focus on the flavor, thin and watery. It, it's milk, but it, it, it doesn't taste very intense milk. It, it's, it's very watery, not very complex, not much, not much cream in there. Um, it, in my case, it, was, it did have a fresh milk aromatic. It was slightly sour on the tongue, a little bit of astringency and dry, and, and the aftertaste almost wasn't there. When you swallow this non-fat milk, you know, you wait a minute and it's got a little bit of dry left in the mouth. So it's clean, but it doesn't have a, a lot of stuff in it for people that are looking for, for more flavor. Now, I then did a low-fat milk, if you have that in front of you, and it's very similar. You know, this is a, this is a little bit less thin, a little bit more intense fresh milk. I actually picked up a little tiny bit of sweet on the tongue in addition to the sour. Um, milk tends to be sweet and sour. We, we very rarely see salt. Bitterness can happen. Um, and then we have the stringent dry mouthfeel and a little bit of aftertaste there. Dry. When we get up to the full fat milk, that's when we now we start to see some harmony. There's enough complexity that it's hard to pick out what's in there. It tastes like milk, but it tastes like there's more there. It's complex, so that's why it's full bodied. I pick up fresh milk and cream aromatic. So if I, if I were to hold my nose, I wouldn't be tasting that, but I'm not holding my nose. Um, it's got some, some sweet and sour. It's got some mouth coating. Now this is the first one that I feel like I have a little film left in my mouth. So because I'm describing my mouth, that's a mouthfeel. And that's a good thing for milk. 
got a little bit of dry. It's going to want you know people to drink more of it. Um, and, and some of that milk and mouth coating and dry lingered into the aftertaste. So one minute after I finished that milk, I still had something left, but it was low level. And then when I did my fourth sample, this was the 100% grass fed uh, sample. So if you have that one, sorry, I'm moving pretty fast here because I'm up against the clock, but I'll give you a second to taste it if you do. Here's the kind of stuff that we're finding. And what I found in this, this was a market sample of grass fed milk. It was very complex. Um, I mean, not as complex as say cognac or, or uh, aged red wine, but certainly more complex, more full body than the first three samples. Um, had a lot of fresh cream and buttery aromatics in there. It did have some sweet and sour. We've been seeing sometimes that's blended, but we've been seeing 100% grass fed milk more on the sour side than the sweet as far as not that it has gone sour fatty acids in the, in the, in the nose, but just a little bit more sour on the tongue. This had more of a fatty mouth coating, dry, but it also had some barney, hay-like uh, notes in the aftertaste. Now, this particular sample I had didn't have much of that, but as I sat there and didn't drink any more and waited, that barniness and that hay, hay-likeness came up a little bit in the aftertaste. And that's one of those characteristics that we're seeing in grass-fed milk. So when we look at milk, we're typically looking at dairy characteristics. They can be both dairy sweet and dairy sour, that's in the nose. Typically looking at sweet and sour on the tongue, but at low levels. Uh, most milks don't have a moderate level of sour or sweet. It's usually slight or, or very slight levels. Um, and then pretty clean. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be seeing in, in milks that consumers, the market leading milks, we don't have these off notes. All right, now cheese. And I did this just to, to get a range. I know people wouldn't consider American processed cheese to really be cheese, but just to show you the difference, we need to worry about a couple things when we start doing cheese. We wanna do the flavor. So in this case, not a lot of balance and fullness, little bit of basic taste, some artificial butter and cheese, but it was very artificial, a lot of oily. Um, and we've got this tacky sticky mouthfeel. So when, when you bite into this American cheese, it tends to stick a bit when you're trying to chew it. And that's a mouthfeel when, you, when you're describing what your mouth's doing. The aftertaste is just oily with a little bit of that artificial butter. So very bland, um, not much cheese flavor there. But we also have to talk about texture. We have to talk about, well, what does the cheese, how do you describe the cheese? In this case, very tender to bite down on, uh, very moist, oily, not chewy. Um, tooth packing actually should be up in the uh, aftertaste because that's describing your mouth. You, when you chew this, it gets stuck up in your teeth. So that's actually wrong. It shouldn't be on the texture, it should be up in your mouth. So now I'm gonna to go to my, my next cheese was some Cabot, extra sharp cheddar, um, moderate sour and salty, but look at everything that comes early. Moderate cheddar or fatty acid sour, some fruity esters, some slight to moderate, um, uh, the, the fatty acid sours again, those are free fatty acids. Some astringent salivating, which we expect in this type of cheese. Some, a little bit of bitter toward the end of the flavor. I put these in order of when I perceive them. And moderate tooth packing means that when I chew this one up, it really does stick in your teeth. Aftertaste, this has a lingering sour, but it has cheddar, some of that fatty acid sour, uh, salivating. It certainly has a lot of salt. Based on all of these results, I would expect consumers to like this cheese. It has early flavor. It has the things they're looking for. It doesn't have off notes. It has the right mouthfeels for cheese. And then as far as texture, it's moderate firmness. You don't want it too hard, you don't want it too soft. It's moderate crumbly, that's a texture note. It is moist, it's got a little bit of oiliness. I was surprised because sometimes this doesn't. This was the three-year one. And then I mentioned that I did this Vermont maple sriracha one and you taste whatever cheese you have now and think about these aromatics, the basic taste in the mouthfeels and see which ones yours have as you're tasting. Um, in my case, it, it was very, I was surprised it had moderate balance and fullness. For, for something that was complex and had the sriracha with the, with the spice in there, it had pretty good harmony. Um, and it was all early. It had some sweet, it had that spicy sriracha taste, but that built over time. A little bit of caramelized sweet. I didn't pick up anything I'd call maple, but it was caramelized sweet in the nose. Had saltiness, which we needed cheese. It had fatty acid sour, more like blue cheese um, than anything else. It had this meaty brothy, which could be sulfur chemistry, and then some fruity esters, and then bite and burn that built um, in the end. And then in the aftertaste, we get more of that irritation, the tongue sting, 
some lingering cheesy notes. I would expect that, that there would be a segment of consumers that likes this, but it isn't a huge volume cheese because it has some things that limits consumption. But as a consumer, not as a professional taster, I was impressed with how balanced this was. Now, from a texture standpoint, wasn't quite as firm as the cheddar. It was a little slight to moderate. Uh, it was moist. It was crumbly. It was a little bit chewy. And that's another measurement we make in, in, um, in texture of cheeses is how, how much do we have to chew it before we feel comfortable swallowing it. Okay. And then quickly, I'll just do, I'm, I'm at the time. I apologize. Um, yogurts. I just did two Greek yogurts. So if you have yogurt in front of you, I did a, I did a plain yogurt, uh, non-fat, and I did a um, raspberry flavored. You can see we've got sour. We should be getting sour in yogurt on the tongue. You'll get some sweets in yogurt, but yogurt should be more sour than sweet on the tongue. We get the dairy component, which is that, again, it's a free fatty acid, yogurt, dairy, milk solid taste. You should be getting astringency, puckering, and salivating. Um, you might pick up some acetic sour type of sours in the nose. So in other words, if you were to hold your nose, you get sour on the tongue, you let it go, it's even more sour because now you've got sour compounds getting up in the nose. Um, you might get some of this chalkiness. It almost uh, almost makes your mouth feel like there's a chalky coating on the inside. Um, texture is important in yogurts, just like it is for cheese. It, this one was slightly dense and viscous, easy to stir. It was smooth. It had some very slight particulates, but it was smooth. Then when I went to the, the same brand, Greek, but this was a raspberry flavor, uh, much more sour, still balanced and full, early cooked ripe raspberries. So those are the aromatics you're looking for. Again, we've got some astringency, some salivating, some acetic acid. These are all typical to type. None of these samples had off notes that I would say would limit consumption, but we would be looking for that as we do sensory. The aftertaste, again, sour, salivating, a little bit of those red fruit esters, a little bit of tannin and dairy sour. These are things that consumers identify with the product that should be there. But we need to measure the basic taste, the aromatics in the mouthfeel. Again, viscosity. Uh, this one was very similar in viscosity, so slight to moderate density, easy to stir smooth. All right, things to remember, and then I'm past my time, but I'll take questions. First thing to remember about doing sensory on dairy products or anything is be safe and, and make sure you're watching out for everybody around you. We don't want to poison anyone. And that means you have a responsibility to understand or, or make them aware of what they're tasting so they don't have an allergic reaction, um, because that's the most common one we see. When you're doing this type of work, you have to try very hard to be objective and descriptive. So you can't say, I don't like that cheese because it stinks. Um, or I like that cheese because it stinks. We don't use words like like and don't like or good and bad. This type of sensory, we simply want people. And what you should be doing is measuring objectively what it smells like, what it tastes like, what it feels like, and then trying to match that up to what your customers want and then trying to deliver it. Know why you're tasting. I talked about that. How you taste, how you prepare the samples, what kind of design you use. Everything starts with, well, why am I tasting? Am I just confirming that I'm making the same product all the time? Or am I trying to fix something that someone told me I have a problem? Know your customer. Well, whether it's a customer that uses your product as an ingredient or a customer that's the end user, it's the same thing. You need to, you need to know what they want from a sensory standpoint, what they want in aroma, what they want in flavor, what they want in, after, in the aftertaste and, and texture. Um, if, you're, if you're supplying an ingredient, if you're supplying milk to an ice cream company, the Ben & Jerry's or, or, or milk... Uh, to, to someone using a nutritional beverage, which is big these days, milk-based nutritional beverages, you need to know what they need the quality of your product to be because it's going to affect the quality of their product. I know Abbott Nutrition goes to great lengths with their, their milk suppliers and milk solid suppliers to do sensory training and make sure they understand what the sensory quality needs to be before they even use it because they know that it's going to affect the quality of their insure or their pediasure. Try to deliver consistently. Um, you can't just do it once. You, you have to understand this, monitor these things all the time the same way, which will help you to consistently deliver quality that your customer wants. Because I tell people all the time, you can miss some quality a little bit, but if you're consistent about that, the customer can deal with it. But if you have up and down quality, it causes huge problems for the end user and it, and it causes huge problems for people that want to use your ingredient. So you want to deliver consistently and have fun. So anyways, apologize, we went a few minutes past, but I will take whatever questions if anybody has any. There are a few questions, Roy, and I just wanna let folks know that this is just the start of our um, sensory work with dairy. So this is 
it's meant to be a you know a quick intro and our plan is to be holding more workshops hopefully in person to be able to build folks skills and sensory for their operations and also for the people that they work with that are um you know purchasing their their dairy products so um how do you describe the mouth coating feel from dairy oils dairy or oils how do how it's it it it's a great question. And one of the things that we are producing to put out to the dairy industry that doesn't exist yet are categories for all these mouth fails. Um, mouth coating is kind of an interesting one because it goes everything from greasy, fatty mouth fails. In other words, you taste something and it just feels like you have a very thick, greasy coating on the inside of your mouth, maybe even on your lips, in your throat. Um, sometimes it's not a fatty, greasy mouth feel. It's just a little bit oily, so not as thick not as aggressive, not as uh, complete. Um, but then sometimes those coatings are, are like powdery coating. One of the things we use for reference data is, is milk of magnesia. If you taste a little bit of milk of magnesia, you get this powdery coating all inside your mouth. So with dairy products, it depends on the fat level, really more than anything, and the milk solids, because we see that whole spectrum with dairy products. There are some milks and creams that we get a lot of this, this creamy, oily, greasy mouthfeel that's all over the inside. And then we have cheeses sometimes that do have particulates in there that we end up with this mouth coating, but it's really not oily and greasy. It's more powdery and kind of a dry mouthfeel all over your mouth. Uh, but there, we use probably a dozen to 20 different terms for mouth coating. And as Heather said, you know, in the future, as we start to get dive deeper now into even these things, then hopefully we can do things in person and provide reference standards for the difference between a greasy mouthfeel, an oily mouthfeel, a powdery mouthfeel, those types of things. Great question. Um, Roy, what do you mean by Barney? Like manure or Barney like hay or Barney, Barney, yeah. Barney, dirty Barney, <laughs> Barney the purple oh. elephant so, or purple dinosaur? Well, it, it's another great question because Barney itself, and I apologize, I'm using my Boston accent, but B-A-R-N-Y or E-Y is kind of a category that reminds you of being in a barn, okay? So if you say Barney that by itself, it's kind of you walked in a barn, you know there are animals have been there, you know there's hay there, but you just get this general Barney sense. And we have a different term, and Heather knows this and Sarah, that we call dirty Barney. Now, dirty Barney is when you start to smell the barn that has too much manure in it. So it really does smell like crap or shit in the barn. So that's dirty Barney. And then sometimes we'll say Barney, but it's, it's hay-like, it's forage-like, it's, it's something else in the barn. So it's still in the category of Barney, but we're getting a little more specific. And as professional tasters, we always wanna at least have the category. And then if we can make it a little more specific, it helps us when we start correlating stuff. So on our, on our grass-fed milk, you'll hear us say Barney, which is just kind of the, you just walked into a barn where there's hay, there's been animals, maybe there's a little bit of manure, but it's just a general Barney smell. You'll hear us say dirty Barney when it really tastes dirty. And you'll hear us say things like, uh, you know, fresh green hay, old spent hay, fermented hay, you know, whatever specific term we can get. All right. And um, the person from Parish Hill Creamery said raw or pasteurized, and I'm not sure what that might be referring well, to. It, it's, it's a great question if I know what it is. If, if you're asking specifically about um, our project, all it's of- It's about our, the cheddar. Oh, about the, the, oh, the cheddar that I had? I think or so, cheddar yeah. in general? Yeah, I think the cheddar that I had was pasteurized. I believe it yep, was. that you had. Yep, it was pasteurized. It was Cabot. Yeah. So, but that's a great question in general because um, we need to again. One issue comes back to safety of panelists. So, for for example, we're tasting we're tasting raw samples from farms right now, but the panel's not tasting them raw. We have a bench type a bench top pasteurizer that we are pasteurizing all the samples exactly the same way, and then looking at that with the panel. We're doing that for a couple of reasons. A that's how the consumers are seeing it out in the market. So if you go to the market and you buy grass-fed milk, the majority of what you buy in the market is pasteurized and marginalized. You can get it at a farm, but that's a very small segment. That's, that's raw. Um, so in general, if we're following that philosophy of tasting like consumers do, then we want to taste it pasteurized and homogenized and 
and if we could even package the way if we believe the packaging wasn't interacting. Uh, there are situations when we do taste, for example, on this grass fed milk, I made a decision that when I get the samples at the farm, I taste them raw and then I taste them after I pasteurize them just to see what difference pasteurization caused. In fact, I did that before we started paneling them just to make sure that the way we were pasteurizing them wasn't going to change the data in a way that we wouldn't meet our big objective, which is figuring out what at the farm affects the end product. So great question. It depends on the customer and it depends on the product which way you want to do it. Great. Um, yes, I think that's it, Roy. And again, thank you, everyone. Um, I know we are going to be picking up our work with artisan cheese makers. And if you are a cheese maker and you're on the call, I see at least one. Um, please, you know, let us know if you're interested in working on this project with us. I. We do have a few folks in particular that we're starting our work with, but I know we want to provide um, more outreach and, and general education um, along the same lines. So anything else, Roy? We're a little bit over time, but not too bad. No, no I'm all set. Exactly what you said. We're, we're always looking for input and always looking to share information that we're learning. So if anybody's interested in, in giving us input and, and helping us, that's great. If anyone's interested in more detailed information on anything I shared now, although we didn't dive, the, the world, the dairy is so huge, we really have to look to future programs to build on this and get more specific. But if there's information we have on our projects that you'd like to learn more about, let any one of us know and we'll make sure we uh, share with you what we have that we can share. Great. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Just a reminder, our next, um, dairy webinar is on Friday and next up in our series is Dan McFarlane from Penn State University. He's going to be talking about cow comfort and improvements that we can make to make sure our cows are comfy wumpy. <laughs> Sorry, that's awesome. Okay, only for me, but thank you again and uh, we'll hopefully see you back on Friday. Thanks, Roy. All right. Bye, everybody.